Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time I've made the decision to film every single book in my collection, which was a bit of an undertaking, to be honest. Um, as we start looking through my sort of hardbacks and uh, older first edition hardbacks, um, it's something that's taken three days to actually film on and off. I've done it in batches and I've tried to uh, film, well, pretty much every single shelf. Now, because I haven't got all the space in the world to store my collection, in some cases there's books in front of books, piled on top of books, so it's taken a bit of time to get everything out in the open, get some half-decent light onto the books, and then film each shelf uh, pretty much in order. Um, it uh, is going to be a really good record, though, um, as I uh, record this in May 2021 of exactly what sort of condition my collection was in at that point. Um, there's some Everyman's and my run of King Penguin hardbacks. Just need the one volume of that now to complete my set of those. And then this is the start of my pan paperbacks. So what I'll try and do is sort of show you a little overview of the area that we're about to look at in detail. So these are the very earliest numbered only pan paperbacks. It's just an odd sort of pan show card for a later later book. And my earlier numbered pans are on that first bookcase there. And I've got a few like related bits and pieces, um, little bits of memorabilia dotted around the collection, which I think helps to uh, keep it interesting, make it look interesting and uh, certainly jives it up a little bit. So we're going to these pan books in a bit de in a bit more detail now, literally stack by stack, shelf by shelf. So these are the very earliest ones. Um, it starts off with the unnumbered hardback pans, and then we go into the just the pa plain pan numbered series, starting right back at number one, and these go up to pan number about four hundred and thirty. I have got every one of these in a in a first edition now. You will see the occasional book more than once. And that's sometimes because with the Pam books, they re-released them. There's like a couple of copies there of Dumb Witness, by Agatha Christie. Uh, Pam would re-release a book um, with a different cover. And the cover would be so significant that it would be worth having the later edition, as well as the first edition, included in the collection. I certainly don't go out of my way to collect later editions, but if they've come my way um, as part of a, a job lot, then I'll uh, I'll keep them. This is the next shelf now, and these pans that we're looking at here are uh, very early 1950s. Pan started in in the late 40s, and obviously they're still going today. Pan Macmillan. But on the whole, my paperback collection, at least, um, pretty much stops with the introduction of ISBNs, certainly for my vintage paperbacks. I do have series which were published, obviously, after that time, um, which I collect, uh, you know, like any, any of my other collections. But my vintage paperbacks tend to be all pre-ISBN. It's just my sort of cut-off point around 1970-71. And that um, is the case for my Pan books and uh, my Penguin collection as well. About halfway through the numbered ones now. Um, you may be looking for, out for the James Bond in Fleming books. Um, I've got those all separate and we'll see those you know, quite shortly. Um, I've got all my Pan um, and James Bond related vintage books um, paperback wise at least all in one place and we'll see those in a minute but certainly Pan were one of my favourite after Penguin they are my favourite vintage publisher um, and I was very lucky when I was growing up that my I had two parents who read a lot um, and my mum was into mysteries and crime titles and my dad more into the adventure stuff so my dad had a nice run of Ian Fleming's 
and Mum had a lot of the crime titles, including an almost complete run of Agatha Christie's. And uh, they were the backbone of my vintage pan collection when I first started collecting, because I'd been gifted all of those over the years, and uh, they were sort of the, the start of my collection. And that's how I sort of got started into collecting old paperbacks, really. Plus, um, I would collect the, um, you know, from a very young age, I collected the, the Doctor Who Target books and uh, some other series of Three Investigators. And, and as you'll see these as we go along um, through the collection. Um, I have, I initially, when I started filming these, I did actually try and keep a rough tally of how just how many books are in the collection now and um, I had to stop eventually it was just taking too long to count them all up at the same time um, but I estimate it's, it's to over 10,000 books to go through <laughs> which is um, admittedly a bit ridiculous but um, if you're a penguin collector it's not all about the content of the books sometimes um, you know books are collected for their cover artists or as in my case in a lot of cases they're collected for the by the publisher I collect by publisher, not by a particular author or even cover artist. But I do uh, collect by series, generally speaking, series and publisher. And these uh, were onto the the great pans now. So these have got a prefix of G or GP for great pan. And these initial ones were just. Um, called the great pants because they were slightly more expensive uh, initially when they were first published and these great pans seem to be the best run of um, the really classic sort of pan artwork um, a lot of covers by uh, Sam Peffer, Rex um, they were pr perhaps my two favorites but so many of the great pan artists uh, uh, worked during this period and the books are just superb they're not always the easiest to find particularly nowadays in nice condition um, but I was able to get um, a lot added to my collection just last year when I bought um, a huge uh, a collection from a, a fellow collector um, and uh, that was a I was able to pad that out quite a bit um, in fact from that collection I do still have over 500 books uh, vintage pans spare at the moment um, all pre sort of 1970 the mainly the earlier period of pan um, I have been listing them on eBay but um, I guess I'm probably a bit too cheap because the books are getting snapped up. Um, so I really haven't had a chance to keep up with putting new books online, but I will do. And um, I will put a link to my uh, eBay auctions in the description down below. So um, do check that out or bookmark me, um, my auctions, because stuff turns up all the time. As soon as I sort of get a chance, I'll put up, you know, I'll get photographed like 50 books and I'll put up 10 a day um, until those have, have gone through because I do like to be comprehensive I put lots of photos up and I probably start them too cheap to be honest um, like 249 299 um, I just want them to go to fellow collectors really um, but if there is particular things that you might be after then do drop me a line um, and I'll see if I've got them in my uh, in my swaps box But I have always, always loved Pam books and uh, some of my favourites. I've got multiple copies of, you know, like reading copies and like mint collection copies. Um, I've got some signed by authors. I've got some signed by the cover artists um, or related people in the book. Uh, I've got some James Bond ones which have been signed by some of the actors who were in the movies, some of the movie tie-ins, for example. And I've seen other sort of YouTubers who, who do uh, a, lot, a lot of book content, because that's not the only thing I do on the channel, but a lot of it is book related. And um, I've seen them do uh, sort of shelf tours. And I thought, well, you know, it's such a huge job. I didn't really know where to start. So I just did it bit by bit, as I said, over a few days. Um, and uh, it's come together quite well, I think. There really is quite a uh, a mixture of stuff in the collection. And on the Pam books, for example, I have done already on the channel 
best part of 25 to 30 videos now where I take 100, 150 pound books in chronological order or publication order and um, I have a look through the books literally cover by cover, book by book and we take a much more detailed look through it um, as I mentioned just before this was the uh, the mega haul that I had last year and, and it did have an awful lot of pan books in it and that's where a lot of them I've been able to get better copies of and filled a lot of holes in my collection but I haven't got them all the great pans here I'm probably still missing about 150 for the set something like that and the pan giants probably even more more like 250 so it gives me plenty of scope for collecting in the future um, and I'm always on the lookout for them but I haven't gone crazy trying to get missing ones you know buying them book by book online because that does prove to be very expensive i do like to buy if i can job lots and then sort through them and uh fill gaps in my collection that way rather than um buying a book by book by book because yeah with the time you do all the postage it can prove to be quite expensive these are the tail end g's now and then uh we'll start moving on to the x's There we are, so that's the very first one, Eastern Approaches. So these are the Pan Giants. And uh, obviously, as you can see, big, thick books. And these were more expensive yet again than the Great Pans or the Pan numbered titles. So these initial copies were quite big, chunky books. Um, they tended to be, these early ones tended to be like movie tines, longer non fiction titles, and uh, some romance in there as well. You notice a few of the romancy sort of titles creeping in there. There's the first Pam Book of Horror Stories, one of the very most, well, probably the most famous series that Pam published alongside the uh, the James Bond books. Once again, you'll notice a couple of titles I've got more than one copy of. That's because they're a significantly different cover or it's a signed edition or something like that. bit of a shaky camera here now that's basically because this bookcase that we're filming now is probably one that was very near the bottom um, a bit trickier to film certainly trickier to get light in to film it properly so once more a little bit of related memorabilia and these are the uh, this particular bookcase then so we start off with those show cards and display stands at the top followed by the uh, the James Bond Ian Fleming related books then we're into the tail end of the Pan Giants. And then we go on to the, the lesser series, the, the majors, the, the T series, the E's and the non-fiction titles. So here's a closer look at the uh, James Bond books. Some books I've got multiple copies of. They've all got different, they're either different printings, they're different covers, um, variations, export copies, some signed copies. Um, not by Fleming, sadly, but a few signed by the cover artists and or actors on the film movie tie-in editions. Um, so that's why you see multiple copies of a lot of these. I've got them all in first, um, and uh, I've got all the movie tie-ins as well. I haven't got all the later Bond books, and there's still covers I don't have. I'm trying to pick up a set of American as well, I'm about halfway on the American set. I um, certainly don't have them all, and there's more I'm on the lookout for, so uh, still cl avidly collecting the James Bond books. Now we're back to continuing the run of Pan Giants with the X series. And it's interesting, I've been, uh, now that we're out of lockdown, I've started you know, when I can, going out on day trips to uh, bookshops. I've done uh, the local ones in my hometown of Plymouth, and I've done a, a book trip to Honiton. And um, it's amazing how little Pam books I've come across. Um, I found plenty of penguins, uh, lots of vintage penguin books around, I guess because they publish so much. But the Pam books, I think, have had a bit of a resurgence in interest, and I think they're 
well I think they're being avidly collected let's put it that way certainly with all the doubles that I've been putting online admittedly you know quite cheap um, but they're getting snapped up and I think people are out there collecting those classic covers I don't think there's many people trying to collect the entire publishers list and uh, I'll certainly pick up anything pre-1970 that I haven't already got um, but there are um, I'm sure plenty of people put in runs of Agatha Christie's together, the James Bond books. I know there's multiple collectors of the pan James Bond books. Lots and lots of people collect those. Um, some people collect the movie tie-ins that they've done. Um, here's the pan major, so the M series. So these are expensive yet again. Another another like run up on the expense front. Just a couple of hundred odd pan M's. Ones that you see lying along the top are ones which are uh, generally new additions to the collection. And that's why they've not ended up going into the main collection yet. Some of these I've actually I've used this opportunity to um, have a little bit of a shunting session and move the books in so that they're in publication order or numerical order at least. And uh, on the whole, almost all my collection now has been completely catalogued and I've got it in just in a little Google Drive document. So if I'm out and about in a bookshop and I'm not sure if I've got a particular book, I shall uh, quickly just look it up and I'll be able to see. Um, obviously, if I've got an internet connection, I'll be able to check the video now to see if I've got a particular book and even what condition it's in, at least by the spine. few classic books here that uh, Quant by Quant's a great one uh, look at the uh, Mary Quant phenomenon in the late 60s and these are a few later ones in the M series some of them not numbered but they are M's uh, so I've kept them I said you'll see the odd bagged book that usually means it's been signed um, these are the big thick E's now the E titles and then that real thick one there like the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich is an H title. Then the T's. I said these later ones, I've not gone to town trying to get them all or anything like that. These are just ones that have basically come my way. Um, and that's why I've got them. Then this was the, the sort of the miscellaneous titles, the Pan Pipers. And these are, these are numbered again. Um, there's lots of missing numbers that weren't ever used. Um, don't come across these very often anymore at least I don't seem to find many vintage pans anymore out in the wild um, so I just think you know because of their age they've uh, started to get very very scarce now and this is just the side of the bookcase that we just looked at I've put a few related James Bond pan book related bits of memorabilia um, photographs of, of vintage shop display and point of sale I think it just livens up the collection a bit um, here's a few of my doubles of the Doctor Who books. So as well as having a run of first, I do like to keep the doubles if they've got different covers. Um, and I have like mint reprints. Um, there's a few uh, Jack Carter books and a few odd Philip K. Dick uh, firsts from the States. This next, bo next bookcase here then has got some uh, more pans, some Hodder Saint books, my collection of four square paperbacks and my collection of pa vintage Panther books. So we'll start off with the tail end of the pans. We've got some Dick Francis, some promo stuff, uh, some horror titles. Uh, little. This is my reprint set of uh, pan book horror stories plus what later ones that I've got in my collection. Here's my run of American first edition Ed McBain's and then the uh, British Penguin editions. Uh, predominantly 87th Precinct, but there's a few other odd ones in there as well. Um, these are some Leslie Charteris Saint books that were sent to me by a viewer. Um, these are the Hodder and Hodder Yellow Jacket editions. They're sent to me completely free. Um, they're going to be in a future video. And then there's some Tail End Ed McBain's, uh, sort of the later later ones there. Now we go on to my run of um, four square books. These are all numbered ones. Uh, they start about 1954, 1955, work their way through. Um, there was a four square publisher in uh, the 1930s just for a little while and then the actual Foursquare 
got revived um, in what you see here um, yeah, in the mid, mid 1950s. A nice little sort of selection of authors. They did a great run of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan books, which I think are great and they're fantastic. Um, they did the early Kingsley Amos books as well. And a nice little selection of non-fiction stuff, which I quite like. Uh, later on, they did um, uh, All the Man from Uncles in the UK. And eventually, uh, the, they became New English Library. Now, these are my very earliest Panther titles. Uh, they do like, numbers 1 to 99, and then from 501 up. Um, a bit of a mixture of... Um, uh, non-fiction titles and very early sci-fi as well there's some good ones in here that one there return to tomorrow by l ron hubbard that's quite an expensive book nowadays um, and they also did a really there's some early asimov that one there the revenge of frankenstein another really really great uh early panther and quite a collectible movie tie-in in its own right they did some nice crime stuff here you'll see the odd sex roma and some good sci-fi there's some later robert van gluck Judge D books and then this is a little run of Anthony Pohl's A Dance to the Music of Time in paperback which actually should go with my Fontana books. Now the next overall bookcase that we're looking at has got some my collection of Puffin storybooks and vintage Penguin specials. So we'll start off with a few foreign Penguin books and then my Penguin classics. Homer's Odyssey was the first one there published uh, in the classic series. I don't have many of those um, Penguin classics. And then as you see, Words of Gummage, Cornish Adventure, that is the original run of Puffin storybooks. This is where they start. They're all numbered again, like the main Penguin series. I've got the first 100 complete. And then between 101 and 330 I've got about half of them I made a point of trying to finish the first hundred and um, the later ones they, they turn up but once again I think they've become a bit more collectible and sought after and um, some of the titles seem particularly difficult to find nowadays um, when you think when they started in 1941 um, working the way through you know even the ones from the 60s and 70s some real classic titles are, are of an age now where they're just not turning up obviously puff and keep their very best stuff in print 161 there is the first ever paperback of tolkien's the hobbit that's probably the most valuable puffin storybook of the sort of vintage period Copies going for £50 plus if they're in particularly nice condition. But there's lots of other ones which are, you know, £5, £10, £15 pounds a pop, depending on how nice condition they are. Certainly the Moomin's books are quite collectible nowadays. Uh, Charlotte's Web, nice first of that, would be expensive. Here's some of my late 50s, early 60s ones into the mid 60s. Certainly some good titles there. Then there's the run of uh, Potarmigan books, which is like puzzle books that Penguin put out. And then with Germany Puts Back the Clock, that's the very first Penguin special, published in 1937. And almost on a bi-weekly uh, basis, uh, Penguin would publish books topical to the Second World War, on the whole, and uh, get these out from, you know, commission to print within a very very short period and the print run on these was astronomical some of them over a hundred thousand so it's not too difficult a set to put together although obviously as the war went on and paper rationing kicked in then the books do start to become quite delicate fragile thinner as you'll see and uh, a bit harder to get hold of i have covered all the the penguin specials in three videos a um, hundred at a time because it's just about 300 in total and I've all bar I think I've got them all bar one now so uh, some of them as I said are particularly difficult to find these days but there they all are as you can see those little thin titles published at the height of the blitz in the UK and uh, they're very difficult to find these days now, at the end of the war, the series stopped for a little while, and then it was revived in the 60s, which is what we're seeing here, late 50s, early 60s, with topical 
points of interest at that point. And there's a few sort of tougher to find titles in that 1960s period. This is the next bookcase that we're going to be looking at in detail. Once again, it's a predominantly vintage penguin and penguin related books. So we're starting off with the end of the Penguin Specials. Biafra story there. Then we got a few Penguin Modern Poets. And then the Penguin R series, the reference books. That one's dating that little particular run in 1961. Then we've got some Penguin Plays the PL prefix into the Penguin Poets which uh, I don't have a massive amount of those I've got a handful of the really nice colourful jacketed ones which you can see there they've got the beautiful beautiful covers on but predominantly I've got mainly the early ones and then we're straight into the Penguin New Writing there was 40 volumes of that I've got the full set of those then a smattering of uh, Penguin Shakespeare into a few paperback buildings of England some foreign penguins again some Australian South African West African then we've got Potarmigan books um, and peacocks which were for teenagers then the music magazines the Russian reviews the film reviews penguin periodicals basically and a few more reference titles then we've got the Penguin Hansard, six volumes of that. Penguin Parade, volumes one and two complete, which is like a miscellany sort of a title. Uh, Penguin Illustrated Classics, there was ten of those. And there's some peacocks. The Penguin English Library and uh, Penguin Guides. few penguin handbooks now quite like that series I'd like to get a few more penguin handbooks because they're quite fun and they uh, they've made a real effort on the covers and that then we're into my uh, services editions forces book club and prisoner of war editions they're quite rare I haven't got many but I've got a few of everything of all the different series then we're on to the American uh, penguins American uh, later ones in the Penguin Specials, US ones, uh, copies of the Infantry Journal, American again, and uh, early um, Bantam books. Those are Puffin picture books, followed by other oblong sort of sized books that Penguin published, Atlases and uh, the things we see. Then there's transatlantic magazines. Those are Alan Lane Christmas books wrapped up. Some more Penguin miscellaneous series, the Penguin story, things like that. Uh, that's all vintage Penguin catalogues and bookmarks. And that's uh, some Penguin modern classics. They do those little samplers for like a pound each, which I think are really nice, those ones. So I got a little run of those. And the next bookcase we're looking at, that's a little shop display penguin, some penguin 50s mailers, um, penguin 60s there. Do you remember those from 1995 for penguin's 60th anniversary? Then we've got Dell map backs. We've got books about books and some penguin related stuff. Uh, we've got more books about penguin, the three investigators. We've got Casca books, uh, photo novels all sorts simpsons star wars john norman gore books um that's a run of my run of vintage corgi paperbacks that's uh, publications of the penguin collector's society they do a couple of magazines a year so we're going to those in detail now so as i said these are the penguin collector's society and they they publish two magazines a year plus one sort of book a year and uh, if you are interested in vintage penguin collecting, that you need to join them. These are my vintage Corgi paperbacks. Now, once again, I've not made a massive point of trying to collect Corgi books, but 
I do really like them. Um, but boy, oh boy, are they difficult to find in nice condition. But they are out there. So I remember going to a couple of times I've been to paperback shows and there's been uh, dealers there with runs of corky books. And they're like outstanding. It's like they, they've never been read. And I think, where on earth have you found these things? So they are out there, but I guess they're maybe stuck in collections now. Um, you, you just don't see old corgi books in the wild. They're, they're just not there. Yes, you come across the old penguin and pan, but an old corgi, generally not. They did some great, uh, great, great titles. And a few later odd corgis and a couple of UK first Louis Lemours. Now we move on to the British Gore books by John Norman. Sort of a cross between fantasy, science fiction and the later ones, well, hour and out sleaze. <laughs> um, they start off really, really good. It's such a promising series, but it just seems to peter off um, from about book 12 or 13, sadly. But even so, they're fantastic to collect. I do love the different styles of cover art, the UK and the um, American editions. I think they are great books in their own right and I've got a little um, stack of the French original paperbacks published by Opta which are also really nice editions. Um, here's a shelf of um, Simpsons related books and uh, episode guides and things like that, a few couple of British annuals. This is a really nice run of um, Dickens. These came out, it's complete Dickens, came out in 1920. Um, it's a really nice edition with illustrations um, I mean, these are virtually mint and they're 100 years old. Um, Dickens is probably my favourite classic author. And um, those are those are tip top. They're really, really good. Um, here's some vintage Star Wars related paperbacks. A couple of odd overseas ones here as well. I've got some Star Wars titles from well, all over Europe, to be honest. These are my later hardback Kingsley Amoses. Uh, the very first sort of eight or nine novels were at the very start of this video um, in hardback first. And then there's a few more vintage Star Wars bits and pieces. Now, these are my miscellaneous British publishers, sort of A to Z. So that first batch there are the really, really vintage ones, sort of 1930s, 40s. Then we come on to the sort of the later British paperbacks. So we've, And these are in rough order. So you've got Ace Books and then arrow uk which i don't really collect just a few odd titles uh, the british beacon books compact british gold medal titles Got mayflower books there pinnacle they're just odd bits and pieces not main series that i collect they're just ones that have sort of come my way and uh, they're sort of vintage so i've kept them world books console so either because of the authors or because of their vintage these are american ones now there's some vintage beacon and uh us gold medal titles a few lancers mcfadden's midwood monarch books Pocket books, pyramid. As I said not loads, but some. These are the Penguin 60s from 1995. Haven't got them all by any means, but I've got a fair old collection. They did produce a couple of box sets. I was a bookseller at this time, so I've got loads of promotional stuff from that period, which is quite nice watches and stuff. Um, these are my run of Dell map backs. Very, very difficult to find in the UK, um, famous for the map on the back. So I haven't got many, but I've got a few, and the ones I've got I really love. If I lived in the States, I would have put a run of those together by now, because I just think they're fantastic. But they're so difficult to find in, in the UK. You know, it's, it's just such a difficult job to put a run together. Here's a little run of Renegade by Ramsey Thorne. It's sort of a adult Western title. Good fun, actually, these. And there's my run of Casca, the Eternal Mercenary, perhaps my all-time favourite men's adventure series about a Roman centurion or legionnaire who cannot die. He's immortal. 
and written by Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler, ex-Vietnam veteran. Brilliant series, absolutely love it. And the ones on the there's some British editions, and then um, uh, Barry Sadler also wrote some Vietnam-related books. There is my non-Star Trek but other series photo novels, and then a few other vintage. Dennis Wheatley's the first a couple of 30s Hutchinson ones and some 50s arrows this is my run of George Gilman's edge books um, Terry Harknut was the actual author's name Gilman's a pseudonym um, the 61 were released in total in the end in the UK um, I think the USA had about 42 43 um, I'm only missing one book which is number 60 and then I've got the set um, it is up on there's a copy as we speak up on eBay now but for 40 quid he can keep it you know I'll uh, I'll come across one much cheaper than that in fact the very last one I got on a buy it now for 10.95 um, volume 61 on its own does tend to go for about 50 60 quid so I, I got lucky on that one there's a few bits of horror a few new English libraries and there is that edge number 61 along with the first of lonesome dove and um, a few of my dirty harry related paperbacks and a nice biography of edgar rice burrow so a bit of a change of pace from the paperbacks now back down into the office where i've got my uh, some more hardbacks so these are sort of autobiography and biography titles lots and lots of these are signed by the authors I sort of collect the signed autobiographies here's some art books i do love um tashin it's one of my uh, favorite publishers it always has been so i've got quite a bit of tashin books there's books on uh, london underground and the festival of britain some film book related stuff There's some uh, men's adventure titles from Bob Dice and uh, Wyatt Dorr. They're brilliant. This is a run of Topps trading card related hardbacks. Little hardbacks reprinting the trading card sets of old. Uh, we we'll start my run of Star Trek books now. Um, got the uh, early Bantam numbered series by James Blish. Then we move on to the photo novels. Um, these aren't quite in order because I've been filming, as we speak, I'm filming the uh, history of Star Trek in paperback at the moment, and I'm on to uh, about number four or five, um, and I've just started, I've just published the first video on the uh, very earliest pocket books, which is a huge undertaking, and I want to make sure I, I do it as good as possible, um, but there are some really good Star Trek videos, I think, on the channel, and uh, worth uh, worth looking into if you are remotely interested in a bit of classic Star Trek got lots of uh, non-fiction as well as the fiction titles there's the other early Bantam titles standalone novels which are great fun more numbered pocket books And these uh, pocket books have been going over 40 years now. Um, and Star Trek books in general, over 50 years, they've got a huge heritage. Probably the best part of a thousand books almost now that have been published on Star Trek or within the Star Trek universe. There's the great Star Trek Strange New World series, really, really good anthology written by fans. It's excellent. more Star Trek <laughs> certainly haven't got them all um, but I have got more in other places as well um, but I've been concentrating on that original series that's the ones that I really love um, but I would like to get some a bit more of the later series if I could find them in nice condition and they are out there then none of the Star Trek books are that difficult to find 
it, that one seems quite collectible a stitch in time my copy of that is actually is actually signed by Andrew J Robinson which is quite nice some odd British Star Trek annuals a nice Tintin anthology I've got a series of Tintin videos on the way uh, where I've been rereading them in beautiful hardback editions um, this is the most recent series I've been working on I've just filmed this lot for a video this is the very earliest Star Trek books then we got a few graphic novels these are 2000 AD related ones uh, from hell and then you've got some Judge Dredd Judge Anderson Bad Company the VCs Halo Jones classic British comic book character then the Judge Dredd annuals then we've got a few more non-fiction hardbacks so these are generally military history in a lot of cases um, books on social history it's a great series out the austerity Britain run there's the uh, great Robert OP scrapbooks a few odd art books and to the right of that is some uh, Churchill related titles including the uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom that's obviously not Churchill but nice first hardback of that one that's the run of the Second World War these are some more modern age hardback first editions that's Boris Akunin and um, some Ian Banks as I said a lot of these are signed copies uh, uh, sadly another Camilleri's um, I haven't got anything signed by him sadly nice folio edition of Tells you the Unexpected, uh, the Ken Follett Pillars of the Earth series, which is great. Um, the Stephen Fry books, uh, Red Dwarf, run of the Kim Stanley Robinsons in first edition, brilliant series. Uh, Julian Stockwin, which is sort of naval character, he lives quite local to us. Um, a great, uh, great author, some Sweeney hardbacks, and some Asterix and Tintin hardbacks. This is the sort of second part of the Giles annuals, these are sort of the later ones up to uh, last year's annual and a few odd reprints and some Fred cartoon books these are some Star Wars related price guides some more book related books um, I don't keep a lot of those around because you know it's for the content not the prices and copies of book and magazine collectors some books on peanuts other cartoon books graphic novels and some actual vintage comics these are non-fiction on the whole paperbacks there's a bit of fiction mixed in there but this is stuff which isn't part of the uh, vintage book collection paperback collection this is contemporary stuff um, which I just have to read it's a bit of a mixture of titles a few biographies I mean it really is a bit of a mishmash of, of stuff sort of holiday reading that sort of thing No, it's a lot of non-fiction Second World War titles. Lots of good books on that shelf. At least good to me. <laughs> Maybe not to everyone else. That JNT book there is fantastic. If you're a Doctor Who fan, it's just brilliant. A little run of Michael Moore. Patrick O'Brien. all the Patrick O'Brien's um, Tim O'Brien there um, yeah Patrick O'Brien he's one of those authors where I only read one a year because there's there's no more to come and I love them so much I've eat them out a little bit some more uh, non-fiction there's uh, some Elizabeth David is a female author that I like published by Virago a short story anthology then we've got a few sort of larger format books, annuals, some run of Blue Peter books, the James Bond annuals, Doctor Who, Faulty Towers, you know, you get the idea. Girl from Uncle, some books on The Godfather, more Blue Peter, Big Book of Mash there, The Complete Book of Mash, a great book that one. Man from Uncle, Mission Impossible, more Star Trek annuals, a few more graphic novels. Charlie's War, Giles Books, 
these are the uh, those ones there are the uh, sort of the reprint anthologies in hardback a few uh, facsimiles and then we're into the main run from number one uh, these are larger format Star Trek and Star Wars titles predominantly I've got all the British Star Wars annuals some Sweeney a few books on top of the pops more Star Wars V book on Vertica these are little books um, that's a run of Will of the Wisp there you can't really see them but they're there um, Star Wars little art books photograph books just sort of small format books those ones these are once again non-fiction on the whole but they're books um, on arty sort of subjects film posters artists special effects um, some Doctor Who again these are sort of larger format Star Wars related books and there's an awful lot of them there plus a couple of odd um, books on books As you can see lots of Star Wars stuff there Uh, my Colditz and Second World War escape story shelf, followed by a little run of um, uh, Quentin Tarantino scripts published by Faber Books, and a couple of uh, larger books uh, on Tarantino and one on Woody Allen there. That's the Colditz shelf. Now we've got some Doctor Who stuff, so a few odd hardbacks. This is a run of the Doctor Who um, Missing Adventure series with the black covers. Great, great series that. And then we're into the uh, the normal Doctor Who paperback run. Um, I collect them in. I have them shelved up in publication order. There's some of their old Target books. They start with those sixties ones, and they work their way right through. There's a little run of the uh, Doctor Who badges, period badges. These are all. Doctor Who books, those are all predominantly, they're later Doctor Who books, but on the whole they're all signed, or multiple signed copies, an odd uh, gift set. Haven't quite got them all back in first edition, but I'm working on it, and most of them on the whole are in pretty nice condition as well. Certainly these were a big part of my childhood growing up. And uh, thankfully, on the whole, they're not too difficult to get a set together, but it just takes a little bit of perseverance, but um, they are all out there. Right, Penguin Books, of which there are many. <laughs> I've collected penguins since I was uh, at school. First ones I had were the Quatermass ones, I think, and the John Wyndham's. They were easily the ones that I remember reading a lot of, and that were in Penguin editions when I first started uh, collecting them. There's a few odd box sets. And... Um, they certainly are the backbone of my collection and starting with the numbering at number one and uh, we work their way through um i've got the first thousand numbered penguins bar about eight or nine books now in first edition some of those i've got as reprints but I, i'm still missing the firsts so i'm almost there um i just don't want to pay through the nose prices for the ones that i'm missing um, i'd rather just wait because I guarantee i pay a a decent price for one of the ones I'm missing like a rare crime and then I'll blooming come across it but I suppose I can always sell a double on if I ever if that ever does happen but um, 
as a general rule, the sort of penguins that I tend to find these days and the ones that I sort of, you know, you can still pick up cheap tend to be ones from the 60s, uh, the late 60s um, or mid to late 60s, really. And they've got really nice sort of funky evocative covers and chances are I haven't got them because I haven't really specialised. Um, I've picked them up over the years if they've been in nice nick. Um, and I've got some real good ones. And I've got most of the ones by authors who I particularly like, uh, such as like Woodhouse or Orwell or later Ernest Hemingway's, um, all the Ed McBain's, for example, uh, lots of similars. Most of those I've got in full runs now. But there's so much else that I'm missing from that period and you know I just I do not have the space to have them all I just don't not at the moment um, so I'm not sure what to do because yeah you know, the collection is in flux as we see it here um, this is exactly as it is right now um, but I do have little splurges and I might decide I'm going to get rid of a part of the collection um, if I feel the time is right and put you know what I make from selling that into something else you know I I like the collection to be fluid sometimes um, but I've collected the penguins so long I think it'll be a long time before I, I break up the collection um, but eventually it will happen and uh, if the price was right everything's for sale isn't it let's be honest but I think, you know, collecting vintage paperbacks is part of my DNA. I've done it for so long. I just don't think I'd want to uh, part with a lot of this stuff. Not unless the offer was really, uh, really crazy. Money's not everything. And um, it's just nice to have this stuff and collect it. The fun of the, the thrill of the hunt. I just feel that hunt is so much harder these days because this stuff just doesn't seem to be out there in the wild. And if you do come across it in a second hand shop, um, the dealer on the whole thinks they've got a fortune and it's often just not the case but hey ho certainly lots of penguin crime and uh, the cerise ones there are collectors who just collect penguin crime the green ones there are collectors who just collect the travel books the those those like cerise pink covers which are great um, or you've got crazy people like myself who collect it all <laughs> tail end of the 500s now I said the handy thing with the penguins is they are all numbered up to about 3,100, 3,200 which is around the time ISBNs came in as I said that's my rough cut-off point, although I've got some stuff past that date. Certainly if I had the room, I would have a, you know, a whole large room devoted to my book collection so I could store them um, so they're not you know piled up on these little piles and then um, just tucked away and these really aren't on display they're they're like in storage almost um, I can get access to them I can pull a book out whenever I want and um, because they are all organized and I, I know exactly what I've got I could just go to the shelf and pull any particular book out without too much problem at all but I wouldn't say the books are out on display in any way, shape or form. And that's not going to happen for a while until, uh, well, until I've got another spare room that I can put them all in. And, we, you know, I can get it bookcased out floor to ceiling. And even then, an average room wouldn't be enough for this lot. I'd have to sort of do, have it on all four walls and then have an island in the middle. Uh, with bookcases both sides um, and that would actually do it that, that I think would fit the whole collection in um, so that potentially is something that could be done and once again I mean you know, it, it, at least they would be stored and I think it would be quite an impressive sight to behold for sure <laughs> this is the penguins number 900 now 900 upwards a few 
got a penguin mug to sort of liven up the collection a little bit. And they are very colourful, that's for certain. I remember doing a book signing with um, uh, back in the 90s with uh, Terry Waite. He was uh, a hostage for five years and uh, he was basically chained to a radiator captive and um, he begged his captors. I remember reading his book and in it he says he begged his captors for just something to read because he was just going out of his mind and um, they brought him a box of books but they were all in Arabic and he didn't have a clue. And he said these are no good, I need English books, English books and uh, they came back with a box of penguins and his heart lifted because he knew, even before he glanced at them, he knew that the books were going to be good quality and uh, when I did this signing with him before he went out to to meet all the people who'd queued up to to meet him and get stuff signed he had a whole trolley load must have been over a hundred books to sign um of his autobiography i think it was called taken on trust um for people who couldn't make the signing so we did that over lunch and i went out and got him a sandwich in there and i mentioned this i said oh, yeah, i am a big penguin collector and i read i did actually i'd read the book before he turned out and I said, oh, I remember reading in the book about your uh, box of penguin books. Now I'm a big penguin collector. He said, oh, I'd love to get some of those back again. And he reeled off a few titles. And they were early ones and, and quite obscure in a lot of cases. So uh, I gave him the um, address of a, of a dealer at the time, of a penguin specialist dealer. So I don't know if he went ahead and bought any of those um, for like old time's sake. But it was interesting. And that's true. Penguin do have that reputation. And they they are a little bit highbrow they're not mass market they're not sensationalist and generally speaking the authors are of a good literary quality and i think that's what stands them out apart from other publishers you know it's it's their point of difference shall we say whether that stands the test today i suppose they do that's certainly if you see something published in Penguin, it's not mass market. If it's like a Penguin classic or a Penguin modern classic, I think that's that's still the sort of aim that Penguin have got today. We are now into uh, the 60s titles, early 60s. And I don't have anything like as comprehensive a collection of these as my very early 30s, 40s and 50s Penguins. But I do find them very, very interesting, and um, certainly I would love to uh, get more. And this is the growth area of my Penguin book collection, is uh, these 60s ones at the moment. Well, the Penguin Science Survey for 1967, so it gives you a little idea. There's the old movie tie in thrown in, and then we're uh, we're almost done on the penguins now. It's pretty much the last shelf of these. Now we're on to uh, another shelf. We've got the Collins Crime Clubs. We've got some very early vintage Albatross. We've got some Fontana paperbacks, Badger books, Digit paperbacks, other early British publishers, some American publishers. Looking over there, we've got some Daw, Churchill, Hardbacks, some more Star Trek. So let's start with these Collins Crime Club paperbacks. These are from the 1930s. And early 40s uh, through through to the end of the war um, very very nice some of them are very very scarce as well and um, they don't often turn up in nice condition um, a lot of these have got their wrappers which is why they appear a little bit more uh, beaten up than perhaps they are I've also got some later services editions as well which is quite nice lots of Agatha Christie in here um, one of the authors I do sort of collect in vintage 
paperback form. But they didn't just do the green crime ones. The, the purples are like thrillers and the, the yellows are often westerns. Um, and then they did a few non-fiction ones as well. A few Canadian Collins books. Now we're on to the beautiful Albatross Library. These are what, um, these came out in 1933, the initial ones. This is what Alan Lane based the original coloured penguin books on. You see they're very, very similar. The size is spot on, colour coded for different genres. There's a couple of American Armed Forces editions on the right there. Um, these are British Toucan paperbacks, followed by Guild Books, uh, Guild Book Services editions. I think that's Chevron titles. Now we're into John Spencer's Badger books. Love these. Never actively collected them. These are all books that have just come my way over the years and they've just formed their own collection. I have always kept an eye out for them because I, I find them fascinating. The covers are great. Um, a lot of them are by Robert L. Fanthorpe who has signed quite a few about 20 of my collection have been signed by him some more penguin mugs there these are my fontana books vintage fontana uh, once again there's predominantly lots of agatha christie's in here amongst some of the crime and uh, authors but uh, i certainly like these i love these early covers and the late even the later fontana editions with those great tom adams covers are great as well and that's what we're looking at here and um, that cover to the uh, 1960s Destination Unknown is, is one of my all-time favourite jackets. And that is by the artist Tom Adams. This is my run of American publishers Hard Case Crime. They reprint classic 40s, 50s, 60s crime titles on the whole and they do some more contemporary stuff which has gone out of print like the Max Allen Collins Quarry series which is 70s and 80s um, brilliant publisher I think um, had a lot of success recently printing some pulpy novels by Stephen King always pick them up when I see them and this is sort of the sleazy end of the collection so this is uh, publications by Nightstand and Newsstand Library um, uh, under the I think it's the Greenwood uh, Press um, these all came from an original owner in the States who passed away and I bought them from his daughter and they were bought brand new, read once and stored. So they're in fantastic collection, uh, condition, absolutely amazing. As you can see, the titles are hilarious. I mean, and this is very, very much soft core, <laughs> um, but they're filled with authors who went on to become big names and they wrote under pseudonyms such as, um, uh, who we got, Harlan Ellison and... Um, uh, Robert Block, uh, Ed McBain, um, Robert Silverberg were all published by them. Um, this is my run of vintage digit paperbacks. Certainly a publisher I do like to collect, but once again, copies tend to be expensive now, five to ten pound a book when you see them, which is crazy. But I guess they're just not turning up, and um, I have no idea what the uh, print runs were on these, but um, some of them certainly seem you know quite quite scarce nowadays um it is what it is i suppose uh certainly digit published the uh the, the uk edition of uh junkie which i haven't got sadly but i've got a fair run of them i've probably got out of the 800 that they made uh or got published i've probably got over 200 there which isn't bad is it a couple of them signed by pef the cover artist um these are hutchinson uh crime library that's with the dagger a hand holding the dagger on the side there and um, they're really nice I, I like those the hutchinson library and then i've got some of their non-crime titles and a few um services editions again which are quite rare and that's my little run of muth and six pennies there's 16 of those that's the six that i've got this is my collection of charlie hickson's young james bond i've got a run of the uh, limited hardbacks the British proofs that Puffin put out. They they proofed all the all of the five main books. Then I've got the US proofs and the US firsts and the normal sort of paperback first of the first two or three books. A few bits of related memorabilia. Every single book there is signed. I did a, a signing event with Charlie Hickson and uh, he was 
good enough to sign it all for me there's a few um gaming books and now we've got some more star trek related paperbacks these are sort of later things which is going to be the basis of my uh next gen ds9 voyager collections but i do need to get lucky and find a nice job lot or two to bulk this up a bit but the ones that have come my way i have saved now here's the start of my run of vintage door paperbacks and they're predominantly sci-fi and fantasy um donald a wilheim is, is door and um these are also numbered and uh the yeah uh, the distinctive yellow spines were predominantly the first five to six hundred books in the series which is what i collect um, i've got a few later ones of course certainly haven't got them all um, and i haven't got around to doing detailed videos of what i have got um, but they're on the way they're, they're on the list to be done and i will do them soon because there's lots of interest in the door library certainly they are very much vintage or i consider them vintage paperbacks nowadays because of their age of the early 70s the first ones came out 1971 72 that's 50 years now that counts as vintage to me here's my little run of uh, vintage mad paperbacks predominantly from the 60s up to the mid 70s um, i've got most of the ones that i uh, enjoyed reading as a kid that came my way the spy versus spy and things like that great fun but once again don't often see them out and about anymore just don't seem to be there these are my uh, comic book related paperbacks These are generally uh, comic strips inside in paperback size, early graphic novels. I have done a video dedicated to these if you want to check it out on my channel. I think they're fascinating and I love them. I really do love them. This is a shelf of vintage Winston Churchill, London to Lady Smith biographies and the set of the World Crisis, his first World War memoir. And on the right is uh, the second World War memoir. Very, very good reads those then the next couple of shells are the complete set of the hutchinson a century of series um, this was quite a tough little run to put together but very satisfying to complete um, a few tough anthologies to pick up there um like the that one there the century of horror for example is a toughie and uh, the uh, centuries of uh, strange stories the evening standard there we are strange stories and uh the, that one there the second century of creepy stories i think was the last one i had to get and that one is once again quite difficult to find but they're all good and there's a, the century of thrillers were published by the express so they're not quite part of that series but they're very very similar now we're on to the TV and movie tie-ins. So these are in rough A to Z orders with the uh, Avengers and into Blake 7 and uh, well you can work your way through but um, yeah these are TV and movie tie-ins. mash books and then man from uncle and most of this has been seen on the channel but not all of it perhaps porridge mission impossible red dwarf again sweeney Tinker, Twilight Zone, a few more movie tie-ins, V, more 
already. <laughs> a, few, a few Beatles paperbacks, Survivors, a few little hardbacks and larger format movie and TV tie-in books. Then a little run of The Pocket Essentials, which is a great little series, those. A little Dad's Army cartoon book. This is the start of my American miscellaneous paperbacks. So these are slightly out of order, but you've got your Ace Books. You've got Avon. And then my run of beautiful vintage Ballantine books, which I think are very, very nice. And that was the rest of it, which we have already seen those. And then pretty much the last part of the collection to look at, and something that's never been shown on the channel before, and that's my collection of vintage Penguin Pelican titles. Now, Pelican are very, very distinctive with their light blue spines. And uh, well, we'll get to those in a minute. There's a few other related ones. So we got the Penguin Science News, which is a big run of that. That's complete. And then we've got the Penguin New Biology, which is, once again, I think this may be one or I've just completed it recently. These are quite, you know, specialists, as you can imagine, but they were published by Penguin in a vintage era. Then we go on to the very first Pelican. So all the Pelicans have got an A prefix in front of their catalogue number and then we just work our way through so um, once again on the pelicans I collect up to the uh, the period which is uh, pre ISBN but I don't really actively collect them so I had obviously I had some in my library anyway because if you collect penguins there's no way you're not going to come across pelicans in that time but I was um, there was a, a fellow book dealer not book dealer, book seller, who I worked with. And he had a massive um, uh, non-fiction library. He did have penguins, but predominantly it was pelicans and new naturalists and uh, observer books. And uh, I basically had his collection of paperbacks. And it included the best part of 500 pelican books. And that's pretty much what you're seeing here. And it wasn't complete by any means, but there was a lot of good stuff here. And over the years, I've slowly but surely started filling in the blanks. So to have the first 650 or so pelicans complete, I think I need about 25 now uh, to have them all in first edition, which isn't too bad. But I don't go out of my way to get them. But if I see them cheap on a catalogue, for example, a pound or two each, and they're nice nick, I'll grab them just to finish that series off completely and I'm very very close to it now but certainly it's not a priority or anything like that because some of the titles are incredibly dry and you're not going to want to read them but then again some of the later ones particularly the 50s and 60s titles are great and um, certainly uh, there are some series which are really really good to this day I do like the archae archaeological titles for example and the the history of Britain series is another really good one um, and as I said, the 60s ones, which um, are a bit more lavish, they're illustrated in a lot of cases, are excellent. But these ones here, I mean, you know, you, the, just looking at the spines doesn't really do them justice because there's so much good stuff in there to, to look through. But you do sort of need to go through the books head on, as it were. And as I said, I've never, ever covered them on the channel. So maybe they do warrant um, at least two or three videos where I, I sort of go through them in a bit more detail and you can sort of see them. So maybe um, as I get quite close to finishing this set, I'll, uh, I'll do just that. Certainly as you get towards the... Uh, 1960s titles, 50s and 60s titles, they do become a bit more interesting because these uh, these earlier ones, they are a bit dry and you probably wouldn't want to uh, spend much time reading them. Although you know, there are some interesting titles in there all the same. Um, certainly some of the History of Britain series are excellent and you know it's history, it's not going to go out of fashion or anything, you know. Um, these are sort of the late 60s ones and certainly the ones if you're out and about and you see a little run of peng uh, pelicans, the ones to look out for are the ones like they've done books on the occult and witchcraft, um, uh, books on drugs and drug taking. That's the sort of thing which um, is quite collectible today. And they're the ones out of all the pelicans that are uh, 
worth keeping your eyes out for because uh, there's lots of interest in that sort of subject as a second hand subject uh, you know nowadays And when the uh, later issues come out, you know, they're much more robust. They're illustrated in a lot of cases. They've got photo inserts and they're, they're great books for sure. Certainly if, uh, if it's a subject that you're interested in, you know, these were the authority. So yeah, pretty good stuff there. So we are getting to near the end of the collection now. So um, I hope you have enjoyed uh, looking through it here's just a couple of boxes of stuff this is an example of what i've got left which is doubles it's all for all going to be listed eventually on ebay i've just got to get around to to doing it and this is the latest stuff that i'm working on right now this is the latest new acquisition so there's always books coming in and uh and going out of the house but yeah i do hope you have enjoyed looking through today's shelf tour and we'll do this again very soon if you have, do please hit that subscribe button and do give the video a thumbs up if you've not already. Thanks for watching today and I'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.